Hey, everybody. Welcome to an episode of Deprogrammed with Carrie Smith. I'm your host, Carrie. Um, today, I'm going to be interviewing one of the knitters, one of the many knitters who've been in the great knitting wars of, at this point, I mean, 2020 to 2022, probably. Um, her name is Tabitha. You may know her as Murder Knits. She hosts a popular knitting channel that is all about knitting and true crime. Uh, true crime being one of my guilty pleasures. So I'm sure we're going to talk about both of these. Very excited. Please welcome Tabitha. Thank you for having me. And I want to apologize in advance if you hear kids in the background. <laughs> That's the uh, thing from Murder Knits is sometimes my kids will make sound appearances in the background. So apologies if you hear them. They're fine. They're alive. That's Christmas fine. Device. Every once in a while, I I wish I had kids to hear in the background. Every once in a while, you hear my dog in the background. So <laughs> people know that. Um, first of all, I forgot to say, you are also, describe yourself as, well, you're a Lutheran trad wife. Yes. What is trad? Some so, people don't know. I didn't know till recently. It's a, it's not really, a, it's kind of a newer movement. I found it on Instagram and it's women who... Um, ascribe, maybe that's, I hope that's the right word, to a belief system that um, men and women are not, they're equal, but they're not. And gender roles are very important. So we, my husband and I follow traditional roles in the marriage. And that ma puts me in this kind of subculture um, of women who call ourselves traditional wives or trad wives. Um, I joined Instagram a long time ago under a different um, profile name and you'll know more why I don't have that because of the knitting wars. <laughs> okay. Later. But when I was, I was on Instagram first, I ran into this group and I had the same beliefs of them. So I joined the community. And so I'm what you call a trad wife. I stay home. I take care of the home. I run my home. I run my house. My husband is a breadwinner and that's it. It's kind of, so there's a there's a lot of Christians in the trad wife group, but there are other faiths that are in our group as well. So it's, you know, there's, there's Jews, there's um, Muslim women, there's non-religious women, just mm -hmm. women that believe in traditional roles. So can you explain a little bit about, cause I've actually heard I, it took, I just recently learned what trad meant like in the past year, maybe. And um, when you say that you believe that the genders are equal, but different, what do you mean by that? I've heard in some Christians call it comp complementarianism. Is yes. that what you mean? So we are equal under the eyes of God. As far as, you know, we're, my husband and I are both sinners. We, we both are equal, treated equally as God. However, God made us different. Um, he made men to be the, the protectors um, that, that have the strength that, you know, and then women are the nurturers. Um but we're equal under the eyes of God, but we're not equal in our, I don't want to say like our society, but my husband, I put my husband, you know, there's Christ, there's my husband, there's me, and then there's my kids and my dogs. Yeah. <laughs> As if you would. And so I'm, maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but that's the only way I know how to, des how to describe it. Yeah. My husband well, is over me, but we're both under God, if that makes sense. So... I want to talk about this for a second. First of all, I apologize for anyone that hears that's Tabitha's computer fan. Just so you know, that's the computer fan. It's okay. We'll get through it. We can't do anything about it. We did try. I know I'm getting I'm, I'm a low tech girl. So if you, if anybody who watches my shows, they know this is like, <laughs> yeah. Hello, murder Nets fans. You're used to the fan. Um, so, so this is interesting because I've, I've recently started thinking about, you know, I'm a pretty new Christian. Um, I started thinking about gender roles and stuff and just in my personal life, how I think it's best, how God wants me to live. And um, I do, I do agree with, I think the man, I mean, I think the man should be the leader in the relationship. I don't think in here's, here's where I have a caveat and uh, people might not like my caveat, I, ideally, I don't think it's always necessarily the best. I admit that there's people are, they always talk about outliers. Is there a situation where it might be better that the woman is more balanced to be the leader? And sure. I don't know every situation. I just think on average men are probably better suited for, as you said, being the protector. Um, 
and the because of biology because of reality and the woman carrying a child for nine months and um and then caring for that child like we in a hunter-gatherer society we grew up grew up with we we evolved with you know women taking on more of the domestic roles and caring for children and it makes sense that you're even biologically even if you don't believe in god it's like women have been more suited for that just um just through evolution yeah and um i my husband it's funny because i run my household i mean i decide what we eat i decide i have equal access to the money all of his paychecks go into our joint account hence all this yarn (laughs) i was gonna comment you have quite a yarn collection it's beautiful thank you so i I decide what we eat. I decide when I clean my house, how I clean it. I decide what I do in my day. There's some days where we knit and we do nothing. And there's other days where I'm on a strict schedule. We must go. Um, But I defer to my husband and things like, what do you want to do on the weekends? What do you, how do you want me to pay this month's bills? I try to include him as much as possible, but he works he works like 12 hour days. So I make a lot of decisions on my own, but the bigger decisions, I always ask him, you know, we've been married for over 14 years. So I, I kind of know what he's going to say. And there's, I have been known to say, Oh, I can't do that. My husband said no. And I never asked my husband, but I just don't want to deal with it. Oh no. You tell a little <laughs> white lie. <laughs> you do a little, <laughs> but you know, well, um, I, I have been, I have been known to say, I need to talk to my husband about this. Yeah. Um, and it's in, in truth, because sometimes like, uh, and, and this might be new for some people in some relationships, especially coming from a place where I was like totally in the feminist world and in the feminist part of SJW. And it, um, and it was very much, we're sort of these autonomous independent people who happen to be in this relationship together. I think that's the way that that it's viewed. Sometimes you're the equal division of everything and no gender roles and separate bank accounts and all this stuff. And that's not the way I operate now. And um, whenever I'm making a big decision now, it's like, of course, I'm going to talk to my husband first and see what he thinks about this. And um, sometimes I step outside of, I try to step outside of myself and view that like from the old me looking at me and and being and judging the old me would be like, you know, Oh, got to ask your husband and like who owns you. Right. And it's like, no, that's respectful. Of course I'm going to ask. You would want him to make decisions, you know, without you like altering decisions without you and i remember the one time before when my husband and i were newlyweds and we didn't have this belief system that we have now and he got came home with a new truck and i was like oh my gosh (laughs) what (laughs) he's like come on your name i got a new truck it's like okay (laughs) you're like uh yeah so so tell me a little bit about um i i you know, you're known for doing this channel, Murder Knits. You combine two very interesting topics. Let's start with the knitting one, because that's how I know you. I met you and a lot of the knitters who watch um, Deprogrammed through uh, the great knitting wars of starting in 2020. What? How, tell us your story. How did you get pulled into those? So I joined Instagram years and I mean... I think my oldest was like four or five and she's now 14. So I, but I was on like a personal, you know, just like a normal account. And I've been knitting for, since I was 10. And so I've been knitting for 23 years, but I was very new to the online knitting community. I never joined. I never, you know, so probably 2018 or 2019, I found that there was like a tag on Instagram that said knitting. (laughs) And so I was like, oh my gosh, my eyes were open to this whole other world other because before I would just knit by myself and find patterns online I didn't know there was an online knitting community and I I found some people through some tags (laughs) and I'm ashamed to say that I got really close to them and I became friends with them and um they are now what I know as the left left just the crazy lunatic women Mm -hmm. of Instagram and the knitting community. But I became really close friends with them. And we would do, I don't really want to say their names, most of the people, because I don't want them to um, come back after me. Um, Yeah, you don't have to say their names. (laughs) But you and your former um, co-host did a a show on one of them. (laughs) 
Oh, I know who you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Um, but so we would do like online knit groups, online um, Zoom meetings. And when I first joined the meetings, it was, you know, there's people of all different kinds of faiths and backgrounds. And um, there was lesbians, there was gay people, there were straight people. It was just like a big melting pot. And that's really what even though I don't believe in that or I don't agree with that, it was nice that we all had knitting in common and we could all just sit down and talk about our knitting and what are you working on? How's your kids? How's your partner? How's your life? And that was that. And then one of the ringleaders in the group, um, one night she uh, said, we need to have a talk. And she, there's like 20 of us in the chat group. She says, we need to have a talk. Um, there's some things going on that we need to know where, where your stance is on things and that, that we need to know that you don't agree with this. And they had made similar comments like that before. And I was just kind of like, Oh, you know, I never agreed with anything, but I was just kind of quiet, like whatever, we'll move on eventually. And we'll go back to knitting. And she said, it was Maria Tuscan <laughs> of Tuscan knits. And, um, it wasn't her saying this. It was, they wanted to talk about They her. wanted to talk about Maria. And I had followed Tuscan Knits because she had beautiful yarn. I had no idea who she was. I had no idea of her political leanings. I didn't even know that this had happened, that Karen Templar came out and said this blog post, you know, I had no clue that was going on until this chat. And they had said, we need to have a talk about this. We need to, how are we going to respond as a group? How are we going to make sure that these people who agree with the right or the conservative knitters, that how they go down? Um, I need to jump in here and just um, set this up for people because I am I know a lot of people are not familiar with the knitting wars or anything you're talking about. So what happened, just to recap, Karen Templer was a knitter who did a, a – a blog entry called my year in color, I think, or something to that yeah, effect. She was going to India. She was, was going to India. She was so excited. She did a whole excited blog. She was a popular knitter. She had a lot of followers about how she was going to India. And, and she had always wanted to go since she was a child and getting the chance to go now as an adult, she felt like she had won a trip to Mars. And there was a lot more in the blog, but, the, but what happened over time is a couple of social justice ideologues who were knitters or maybe not who knows in the comments started taking her to task and saying that she it, it was colonialism it was racist it was it was all of these awful things to say that to make an analogy and use that expression to say that that going to india was like winning a trip to mars that that was somehow otherizing indians and people of color and this huge pile on developed a huge pylon where she eventually ended up apologizing for something she didn't even t intend to be offensive or racist or anything. And it still wasn't enough. And it sparked all of this. Like it was one of the first, I'd say, wouldn't you say Tim, you were in it, but was it one of the first big battles in the knitting? Yeah, that was, there were little things here and there, but this was like the huge, this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. It got everybody involved. Yeah. And so Maria Tuscan, who Tabitha's talking about, Maria Tuscan was also a knitter, a yarn dyer who, um, who her sin, that as they saw it, was simply making a video saying she wasn't, she wasn't going to participate in this, and she was going to actually take herself off of Instagram for a while because it was getting so toxic, yeah. and for that, they mobbed her. They got her banned from knitting conventions. They um, contacted people she did business with and tried to get them to disassociate from her. Some of them did. You know, she went through great unf unfair cancellation and, and mobbing. And um, and so there's the background. So they so in this group you're in, they say, we have to talk about Maria Tuscan. Yes. And okay. in that conversation, I said, you know, I don't really know a whole lot. I'll need to look into it myself and I'll get back to you. And so they said, okay. And everybody had to go around, you know, like a big circle and state what they, what their stance was on that. And I said, you know, I said, well, I do follow her on Instagram, you know, but I don't know. I need to look into the situation myself and I'll get back to you. And so they said, okay. And then it was the next 
Zoom meeting and something else had happened. And I wasn't, I don't know if it was um, Boylan Networks had made a comment or was upset with some of the SGW knitters and she had actually blocked one or two of them and they found out and that blew up in her face. And um, we, we had another Zoom knit night and they wanted to think of ideas of how to cancel Boylan Networks. How were they going to um, cancel her to make sure that she had no more business? And wow, for simply blocking two people. Yeah, they would plan. They was, I'm so ashamed of it now that I was even attending these knit nights. I thought that this was like everybody. Like I thought this was like the knitting community. Like this is this is who these people are. And, um, they would, they would, we had like an Instagram chat and they would be like, Hey, we're going to have zoom knit night come, you know, here's the information for it. And they would plan who they were going to cancel next, how they were going to do it. These were not organic things that, you know, like somebody saw something and this is who, you know, a call to arms. This was a lot of these were pre-planned attacks because they were either jealous or they didn't like them. Yeah. Um, so they were talking about Boylan Networks and what happened there and how are we going to do this? And I said, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing this. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to leave this now because I don't feel comfortable. I don't, I, Boylan Networks has a lot of great designs. I've tested it for her. I don't agree with her, any of what she believes, but she has great designs and she doesn't deserve to have her livelihood taken away because she blocks somebody and I would block that same person because she's a basket case and yeah. you don't need that in your life. In your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I said, I'm going to leave and, um, you know, I'll see you guys later. I don't feel comfortable. And then one of the ones, um, private messaged me and she goes, we need to have a talk. Are you available for a phone conversation? I said, no, I, you can message me. I'm not, I'm busy. And she goes, well, I need you to unfollow Tuscan Knits if you still want to be my friend. Wow. And it's I'm so like, explicit. I yeah. mean, they're not afraid of being outright culty. Like, no. And I'm no, I, at this time, I mean, I'm still a nobody in the knitting community, but this time I was truly a nobody. I was just, my Instagram handle was Tab the Jade. I was just, you know, like a private person who posted pictures of her kids and her knitting and what she was doing. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, anybody, I wasn't a business. I wasn't nothing. And I said, well, I don't agree with that. And I'm sorry, you feel that way. She goes, well, then I will have to take actions into my own hands. And I said, okay, that's fine. So then she took it upon herself to message all of my followers. And since I was a nobody, it was family and friends to let them know that I was racist because I followed Wow. Look at how many degrees of separation of, by the way, guilty by association. By the way, Karen Templar said she was excited to go to India. Not a racist for saying that. Sorry, not. I don't buy into your, their crap about like, oh, it's somehow secretly racist to say, to make an analogy that it felt like something otherworldly to her to be able to go to this magical place that from her childhood. That's not racist. Then Maria Tuscan simply says, I don't want a part of the pylons. Please, I'm going to go off Instagram. It's Things are getting really toxic. They call her a racist, call her a white nationalist, all this stuff for saying that. We're not exaggerating. If you got, I know there's probably some gamers, guys, and nerds watching. who have, This is what happened. They called her a racist. They called her a Nazi and stuff and tried to destroy her business. Then you, now you, your family and friends are getting messages from people saying now, Tabitha is a racist. Why? Because she follows Maria who didn't want to get involved in the pile on, on Karen. Like how crazy is that? Yeah. So in my family, <laughs> I'm from a very redneck rural part of Oregon. And my family's like, we don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them respond like, we don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> and so, but it got so bad. And I was so just inundated with messages after messages. I had to delete it. Because it was just awful. And so at the end of... You deleted your whole account? I deleted my whole... I, I said, I'm done. And um, at the end of it, I had found Unsafe Space because you guys had interviewed Maria. And I had found the knitters, the same knitters in that group. And then I was like, you know what? I can't. I can't do this anymore. 
And so I deleted it. And then I decided to start this murder knits, a public, but kind of private. I mean, I used to post pictures of my kids, but then I had a porn bot contact me and I was like, no, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I don't post as much as, you know, I, I block all my kids out and stuff. And that's also to protect them from these people. Cause I don't want these people to know about my kids. I mean, some of the ladies I got really close with, you know, and it just completely turned. So isn't yeah. that a learning experience when I've been there where you realize you were very close to someone who you, you don't now you realize I didn't know that person at all yes. and what they might be capable of yes. with the things I shared and everything. Yes. Yeah. So I started murder. Nets. It's funny. Cause I actually contacted Maria <laughs> to get her permission for the name because she had um, wanted to do like a murder Nets line because of her married last name. And so I said, I'd love to use this name, but I would like your honor, your blessing before I do it. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, I started this channel, this page, and um, I was like maybe six months to eight months into it. And I woke up one morning and I had lost access to my page, my Gmail account, and my YouTube account. Okay. And all of my YouTube shows that were doing really good, my knitting and uh, true crime YouTube podcasts were deleted. They deleted them from your YouTube channel. They, they hacked into my Gmail account. I know, so I know who did this, but I don't have like proof to do anything about it. I just, and I don't feel comfortable outing them unless I have like concrete proof, but I right. do know who did this. It's a SJW knitter. Um, they hacked into my Gmail account, which got them access to my YouTube account and they deleted all of my YouTube videos. I had like 15 of them completely gone. Um, they got into my Instagram account. They tried to take that down. I got access to that back after three days and I got access back to my account and my YouTube account, but I lost all those videos. Wow. So I had to do get you... all the security. <laughs> um, do you know how they got, how they hacked you? I don't. That's, I don't know if they guessed my password I don't know how they, I know some of them on that side are tech and um, one of them who is friends with the one who did it works for Google. Wow. Okay. So I, I don't know if that has any connection to it at all. So they attacked me the first time by my family. And then the second time they deleted my channel. <laughs> That's awful, Tabitha. I didn't know that part of it. Okay. So you got your Instagram back and <clears throat> you've in and you've regained access to youtube and everything and um so where where are things right now with you and these former you know people that you thought were friends and and the social justice world like do you are you still a target of theirs i don't think so i think they've moved on um i went on politically incorrect knitters and i told a little bit about the story on there and i've been more vocal with them about it and i pretty much don't care anymore. I mean, if they got into my account again, it would be a miracle because I have so much security guards up, but it's, I mean, anything's possible. Um, I don't think they will. I think they're onto bigger and better things. Now there hasn't been a whole lot of dust ups in the community, you know, as a whole, it's a lot more infighting. It's a lot, mm -hmm. they kind of leave us alone now. Um, every once in a while, bitchy knitter will say something or, you know, She'll try to round the troops again, but it, she doesn't have the hold like she used to, mm. you know, whereas before she could get a whole bunch of dust ups on her Twitter and her stuff. Uh, they have been going after Neil from Blocked, and I've been helping him with that. Blocked Cause Magazine. Yeah, because it's the same. It's the same group. <laughs> um, but I think they're kind of, I don't want to say that they're done with us, but I think they're they've been canceling a lot of their own lately and it's just been fun to watch. <laughs> they do. It's, this tends to happen. I've seen this play out in other social justice communities. And even when I was still in it and would watch it, not really knowing what to do and kind of just observing, but they eat their own. That's yeah. what this belief system is. Nobody, it's a purity test and nobody's pure enough. And it, once they've kicked out 
all the wrong thinkers like you or like Maria, people who, who show that they're not easily manipulated and won't not easily pressured and won't bend the knee and won't kiss the ring and won't conform from that peer pressure. Those people get thrown out and then they start going after the ones who are left. Like they turn on each other. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's incredible. Um, do you think that on online on the, in, in, on it, let's talk about Instagram specifically. Um, do you think that the social justice knitters still have, you mentioned this one doesn't seem to have a lot of the same power that she used to. Do you think a lot of them, they still have the power to influence ideas and to spread this ideology or are they losing power? I think they're losing power. One specifically, she tried to do a cancel out not too long ago and people were like, well, that's stupid. Like, you know, I don't believe that. Or, and this other lady tried to call out, um, pattern designers who didn't she didn't like that they didn't get so yarn is expensive not all i mean you can get basic yarn you can get basic i mean this is expensive yarn but i have a ton of not expensive yarn and this one designer or influencer in the knitting world was upset because she her patterns that she knitted called for expensive yarns and she said that that was you know, ableist or classists who only use expensive yarns and the designers like you can use whatever yarns you want if you get gauge i don't care mm -hmm. so a lot of their arguments and call outs are pretty petty and i think a lot of people see past that now you know who cares about what yarn i mean we've got bigger fish to fry it's a lot when this happened trump was still in office and things are really good I mean, you didn't have to go in and figure if you were going to be able to afford gas or groceries because you could afford both. Um, jobs weren't an issue. Life was, whether you liked him or not, life was pretty good. And so people had not as much worry. So they could, you know, if you don't have to worry about how you're going to feed your kids, of course you can bitch about yarn online and you can complain yeah. about stupid things. And now it's, I've seen a lot, even with the SJW knitters, it's like, I cannot do this anymore because i don't know how i'm going to feed my family or you know my kids are now depressed because i made them wear a mask for two years and mm -hmm. they're suicidal i don't have time for this knitting drama anymore so that's a huge part is just with the change in the president and where we are now people don't have the luxury of worrying about that anymore it it's it strikes me that and, and I know lots of people have noticed this, um, but they they tend to fill it because if they don't have actual struggle, I think sometimes humans have that tendency. If you don't have actual struggle in your life, you will find it. Mm -hmm. You will find drama or something. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of social justice is or meaning. They don't have actual meaning. They'll find it in this sort of crusade and yeah. witch hunt against anyone who doesn't pass the purity test, which yeah. in the end is no one. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Murder Knit. So you talked to Maria, you got her blessing to use the title. And um, why, why true crime and knitting? I've been watching, I've been researching the John Benet Ramsey case since I was like nine, <laughs> which is wholly inappropriate for a nine year old to be doing. <laughs> um, I've just, that's, I've always been in a true crime. I used to, fake being sick so I could watch Law & Order SVU all day. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I've got to get the next episode. <laughs> You're junkie. Um, and I thought this would be really cool. There was nobody... A lot of people do knitting podcasts. They have knitting pages. But I get... Personally, I get tired of where it's just knitting. Like, mm -hmm. I... I Knitting... Like, this one podcast that I really like, but I don't watch it now because they went ape shit. Um they would do knitting and then they would talk about their life or other things. It wasn't just knitting. And I love knitting, but I'm, I'm like, okay, we can get past this. And I thought, how cool would it be if I talked murder and knitting? Like nobody was, there was one person who was doing it. Um, but I made sure that mine was completely different than hers. Cause I wanted to respect what she had mm -hmm. going on. I didn't want to take from her. And, um, so that's, I was like, I'm just going to, I asked my husband's blessing. I said, what do you think if I did this? Like that would get me back online, you know, and in a, a knitting community because my yarn shop where I live is 45 minutes away. 
So there is not really a knitting community where I, there's people that knit where I live, but we don't see each other. We don't, you know, there is a knitting community here. Um, so that would get me something, you know, some mm -hmm. friends or something. <laughs> and he said, yeah, that's fine. Um, he doesn't want me to talk about. There's some local cases that I really would like to talk about because I know a lot, but they're unsolved and they have to do with some drug dealers. And he's like, no, we're not talking about that. <laughs> he's like, don't touch those yet. And then there's this, there's this one case. It's kind of creepy, but um, there's a missing persons case. And the sub, the sub suspect in that is someone I dated in high school. <laughs> so he's like, don't talk about that one. Anyone that hits close to home, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... What what do you think it is? Uh, and I've I've had this conversation before because I'm true crime is one of my guilty pleasures. It's um, I don't know how to explain it really to people who aren't interested in it. You either are interested in it or you're not. But it but it does cause me to think about why I'm interested in it. Yeah. It's the thing that I watch. It's it's funny. Um, um, because I talk about ideology and ideas and and cults and authoritarianism and all this stuff. Um, online. And, and with people that in my, when I want to wind down and not think I want to do something different. Right. And I don't watch a lot of, um, podcasts anymore. Like I do, I won't go back to them. I have phases, right. Yeah. Um, I will watch so much Friday night tights. Cause it's like, you're just hanging out and having fun. But, um, but now I just put on the true crime, my favorite true crime podcast or whatever, yeah. you know, and I listen to those and, and, it seems from talking to people that women are more riveted by and interested in true crime stories. So why do you think that is? Is that true in your experience, first of all? And second of all, why do you think that is? I think, well, I think people think that women are more interested because men don't like to admit it. Cause my husband is, he's funny. Cause I'll watch it. Like when the kids are gone and I'm, he's watching TV and he'll hand me the remote. And I'll be like, well, I'm going to watch a merge. He goes, that's fine. I think it's interesting too. And I'm like, Okay. See, <laughs> um, my pastor, um, I know he watches, I don't know if he watches a lot of true crimes, but like he watches my podcast and he knows exactly what I'm talking about or who I'm talking about. <laughs> so I, I do think that some men find it interesting. Maybe they just won't admit it. I don't, but I don't, women are dramatic. Women like drama and it's, I don't know if it's the attraction. There's some women who find themselves attracted to the serial killers or the bad guys. And that part of true crime actually kind of disgusts me. Like the whole Ted Bundy oh. plot or. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm right there with you. <laughs> that is not why I watch true crime. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I had um, a person who does a podcast, a really popular one, reach out to me and she wanted to do a show with me. And I was like, well, let me see what you're about. And I was like, I can't, I, you glorify the, you know, the killer. I, I can't. So I think that's a huge part of it for women mm -hmm. is that they're attracted to the bad guy or they think they could change him and maybe he wouldn't do that to her. That's mm -hmm. kind of why you have women that are in love with, you know, people on death row or, you know, they write to prison people. Okay. Or, I can see that. I get um, it. I, 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 I personally just curious. I'm interested in why people do what they do. Yeah. I could sit in at Walmart and watch people all day long. So I don't know if that has anything to do. With okay. It. This is, we have this in common. Um, <laughs> I think it's about understanding humans and human nature and understanding myself better too through that. And yes, I can sit and people watch forever. And, yes. um, I notice things sometimes that other people don't about interactions just because it's like interest. People are interesting. And I think that it might be with true crime that um, there's also this element of like, of, of wanting to understand, to, to relate it back to the stuff I talk about on the, sh that we talk about on the show, ideology, all this stuff, wanting to understand human nature better and why people do bad things yeah. and, and understand like good and evil better. And even within ourselves and by looking at extreme examples of it, understanding that better, I think it helps us I just understand ourselves and each other. I, I've went, I've done a couple of deep, deep, a year long deep dives into the FLDS group, mm -hmm. um, some into the Mormon church, but mainly the FLDS with Jeff, um, 
with the Warrens and um, the Jessup group. And I've done a couple deep dives into a cult that was in Oregon. I've actually driven through the town. The if, Have you seen Wild Wild Country on Netflix? No, with, I haven't. You, know, you need to watch that. Okay. Yeah. That happened in Oregon of this. I don't there. I think it's a, depending on who you talk to, it's a Hindu sex cult um, that tried to take over a rural conservative Oregon um, uh, agricultural town in um, Wasco County in Oregon in the 80s and it did not go well. They tried to, the group tried to poison everybody by putting um, E. coli on the salad bars and restaurants so that they wouldn't vote in a, in the upcoming elections. It's wild. Wow. Crazy. Wild. You know, I've skimmed by that one before. It's I'm going to so watch bad. it now. That I watched so one on the FLDS. It might've been at your suggestion. It was somebody's suggestion about to watch the one. Um, uh, Keep, Sweet. Keep Sweet was very eye opening yeah. and um, disturbing and interesting and all of that. And, and tragic. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um. So what kind of what kind of cases are you following lately? Like what's a case that you're So I'm really I'm if if you haven't seen The Keepers on Netflix, that's about a nun who was killed um at the hands of Father Maskell. Um if she was a teacher at a local high school who was trying to sound the alarm of girls getting abused and she was murdered because of it. I've been doing a huge deep dive into that one. And I'm hoping to talk with Neil about that one some more um, on his show because I a lot of people want me to talk about that, but I don't really want to talk about it by myself because <laughs> it's yeah, it's a lot and it's still um, it's an active investigation, but the people surrounding the murder are still alive and trying to keep people quiet, specifically the IRA. So I said that if Neil was willing to talk to, with me publicly about it, then I would I would you know we would do an episode on it, but so that's one um, that I'm still, and Neil's been researching that as well. I always go back to the FLDS. Um, there's crime weekly is one that I, I listen to on a regular basis and, and what they cover a lot of cases that involve kids or religion are ones that I prefer to listen to. And I, I'm weird. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah. You got gravitate. Well, those are the things you probably care a lot about. Yeah. Is there, is there a particular case that you think I should know about? At Summer Wells, if you don't know about that case or the Hart family. Okay. Who, who's Summer Wells? I don't know if I know that one. Summer Wells is a girl who went missing about a year ago in, um, I believe it was Tennessee and the it became famous because the parents went on Dr. Phil and he tried to interview them and the mom had a meltdown and stormed off stage and the cornbread mafia was blamed and the girl's disappearance. What's the cornbread? No, I have not heard of this one. <laughs> um, I definitely haven't. What's the cornbread mafia? Well, depending on who you ask, it's either a human trafficking, um, active drug cartel group based in the South. Or it was a group in the 70s and 80s who grew pot and they're not really around anymore. But when Dr. Phil and the investigators brought up the Cornbread Mafia, the mom of Summer Wells, her total expression changed and she stormed off the stage. Wow. Okay. So they still don't know what happened to her. They dogs um, tracked her sitting down to a road. But from there, it's disappeared. The dad of Summer Wells was accused of um, sexually molesting his sister when she was the same age that Summer was when she went missing. So authorities have thought maybe it was something to do with that. It's a really interesting case. Crime Weekly just covered it in like a three-part series. Um, they know more about it than I do. But that one I thought was interesting because this little girl went missing and it's I think that the mom something happened and the mom was neglectful and either didn't know what happened because she wasn't paying attention or somebody came up to the property and, and abducted her because that although people don't like to admit it human trafficking and kidnaps happen a lot more than what people think hmm. 
Um, yeah, I'll have to look that one up. I hadn't even heard of it. I I tend to watch um, some of the ones that I that I've watched are the the ones kind of like. Um, Gosh, like the Columbine kit murders, you know, the the nihilists, these young men who decide they're going to kill a bunch of people or try to kill a bunch of people. And um, the people that get called crazy. But I think that's just a big catch all word. Like, what does that mean? And when I look cl more closely at some of these cases, I it's like very clearly some type of what we call personality disorder, <laughs> which. I think in the past we've also humanity's called evil, like just evil or possession. Um, there was one I wasn't familiar with that I watched uh, recently, and it was it was um, uh, uh, two guys, two two friends who went to high school together and decided this happened after Columbine. They decided they wanted to emulate the Columbine killers and kill as many people as possible, but they were going to video, they were going to make a movie from it. Mm -hmm. And so they're, I can't believe this one wasn't higher profile because they actually recorded a lot of really disturbing stuff. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Okay. Um, they took videos of themselves planning, joking about on camera, like who they were going to target. And um, unfortunately the, the first person and only person they killed before they got caught was one of their friends, like a girl who they had been over at her house that night watching movies. And then you see them later on the video camera saying, yeah, we're getting ready to go back over there and do this. And we're going to scare her first. Oh, they, in the, if people want to look up this case, they were called the scream murderers. They loved the movie scream. They wanted to scare her and then, and then kill her. And they were basically like, um, at some point you, in their video footage, you see them talking about God and evil and stuff. And that gives you real insight into the what's wrong with them. Because to, to see people like that with, display like absolutely zero conscience, like whatsoever. And to say, you know, God isn't real. They were mocking God. They were like, God isn't real. Evil, evil isn't real. There's no good or evil. That kind of thing. Anything goes. Mm -hmm. um, it's a real window into nihilism, I think. One case that you should look into if you haven't is the Hart family. That was a local case. I'm sure you you'll know who it is. My these two, and I'm I'm gonna say the skin color because it's important in this case. Two white SJW lesbian couple adopted. Who I know this case, but go ahead. Yeah, adopted, tell people adopted four or six black children and horribly abused them. <clears throat> And posted on their social media how wonderful and how liberal and how amazing they were. And they murdered the kids. And in the investigation, I found out that before they had adopted the other children, they um, had a foster, a young black girl was in their foster and they deserted her at the therapist's office. And authorities allowed them to do that not only just desert her at her counselor's office and never go back to her again authorities in multiple states uh, allowed them to keep abusing the children that sh they had adopted so the four children that they had they adopted i believe they were from texas and the kids in texas were sent to they either lived in minnesota or in michigan the heart women and um so the CPS in Texas allowed an out of state white couple adopt these black children um, and to not, they had family members that were trying to get them to keep them together. And the state said, no, they're going to go to these women out of state. And those women, before they got the other siblings and the other children, they were actually convicted of abuse and like got probation and they were allowed to adopt more children and do more out of state child trafficking basically mm -hmm. is what it is. Even though there was family that were trying to get them and keep them and they moved to Washington, they were, they got an abuse charge in the Midwest somewhere and then they moved to Washington and the children were um, people around the children were, you know, trying to report to CPS and they were under CPS investigation and they, um, CPS had, was coming that day or the day after, and they had drugged the kids and drove off a cliff in California to kill themselves and the kids. One thing that really bothered me about that case was that 
they had, they lived a double life mm-hmm. and all of their friends on social media said that it was horrible. There was no way they would do this. You know, these good women, they, you know, they believed they were a lesbian couple. It was like, basically, I believe that these women were racist as hell and that they were abusing the kids and they put them up to be, look at me. I'm this good, virtuous person. Yes. But behind closed doors, they were abusing these poor kids. They were starving them. Yep. Yeah. Um, one of the boys it was made famous. He was hugging a police officer in like this rally and people thought it was like this huge, nice thing. You know, look at this. He's like hugs, free hugs. I think his name was Devante. Devante. Uh, yeah. And he, in the picture, he's crying. And now knowing he's probably thinking, please save me from these horrible, abusive women. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows what was it? Because you only see that's such an, a great lesson in like an image, the power of an image and not really knowing the full story behind it. That photo for any, anyone who doesn't know, you should go look it up. Yeah. It's, it's him crying and hugging the police officer. I think it was a, like a black lives matter rally yeah. or it's something. And, and I looked at the social media feeds of these two women and the stories, you know, in the news articles that followed. And you're right. They, they would take the kids and parade them um, like like we see a lot of these social justice women doing, using their children as these symbols of virtue mm-hmm. and using trans, their so-called trans kids in this way. Um, these two white women use their, their adopted black children like this as, as badges of their goodness. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's such a, that's such a tragic case. How do you stay upbeat when you're covering true crime? <laughs> If you ever watched my show, I'm probably snarky as hell. I have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, honestly, it comes in, it, you know, there's some days where I, it's, I don't watch true crime or listen to true crime when my kids are home. Mm-hmm. And I, that probably helps. Um, so I don't have it around all the time, but you know, like when they're gone at grandma's or, you know, my husband takes them somewhere, then I do watch it. I, but I think that helps us to not be plugged into it all the time. Um, but I have a really bad dark sense of humor. It's probably- <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people who, who, who look at the darkest side of humanity, like in, in, in people who that's their job, like cops or, you know, yeah. um, they have, I've heard they've had very dark, wicked sense of humor and you almost have to develop that thick skin. Right. Yeah. With all the things you're observing. Um, can we switch gears here for a little bit and talk about your faith? So you're Lutheran. I don't know anything about Lutherans. What does well, that mean? This will probably make people mad, but we are the correct Catholics. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> we are the true Catholics. Um, okay. I didn't even know Lutherans are Catholics. That's how ignorant I am. Well, okay. So there's two sides of the Lutheran church. There is the correct, and this is where I, I will be dogmatic. And I, there's the, there's one side of the Lutheran church that a lot of people know. You okay? I swallowed that water the wrong way. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I don't know if I can edit that out smoothly. We might just leave that in. Anyway, tell me about the two sides of the Lutheran church. So there's one side, there's the ELCA, which is the, we have women preachers, the um, abortion is fine in the church gays and lesbians and trans are fine in the church um it's like the pagans and the witches are fine it's worth there'll be people that preach that that that's lutheranism and that's okay and that is not okay that is satanic um it is awful that they have the lutheran name in them and then there's the good side of the lutherans that's the lcms the els and the wells um i am currently els although i was brought up lcms those are groups or branches of the Lutheran church. And basically in the 1500s, a man named Martin Luther in Germany had a problem with what the Catholic church was doing at the time. And he tried to call the Pope and the church out, you know, back then the church was raising money for new churches. So they would say things like, you know, buy this piece of paper to get your sins forgiven Buy this, you know, and get out of purgatory. And those are false teachings. And so Martin 
tried to get the church to say those aren't correct and tried to correct them and the Pope kicked him out. And so that's mm. basically where Lutherans came from. Um, that's a very broad, it's part of the Reformation. A lot of people, um, John Calvin followed after that. And there's some other pretty big prominent features, but essentially the group that left, I would consider the true Catholics, the ones that believe nothing but, you know, Lutherans are grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, and mm -hmm. anything outside of that is not correct. Um, and there's a lot of the Catholic church that has deviated from that, but if they would have gone back to the roots and not done that, then Martin Luther would never have left and there would not be the Lutheran church today. We would still be Catholic, mm -hmm. which I'm sure my pastor will comment and say that I'm awfully wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, so you guys, uh, is this, is the service similar to, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't been to a Lutheran service. It's similar to a Catholic. It, well, if you go to, um, of those three, if you go to an ELCA church, it's like a pagan ritual. I mean, it's really not, but if you go to, um, a conservative confessional Lutheran church, it's a lot like the Catholic service. There's a lot of our, our pastors wear robes similar. They have, the, okay. You have hymns, you follow a traditional liturgy, you go up, if you're communed in the church, you have communion, there's confession and absolution. So uh, there's a lot of similarities. Um, I've been to one Catholic service when my husband's grandma died. And I thought I would, I mean, I knew she was Catholic and, you know, they had, you know, like the Virgin Mary picture up because that's one big thing with the Catholics is they pray to the Virgin Mary. We don't. Um, so things like that, that that we don't do but it's mm -hmm. very i mean if you didn't know you wouldn't know basically the difference it's yes yeah, it's very similar okay well thank you thanks for <laughs> I've, I've got to visit a lutheran church now to see i've got a long list of different churches i want to visit how does your faith inform this is something i've thought about a lot with my faith and how does it inform my my outlook on um the world and politics and have you always been like Lutheran or? So I was my, my mom at the time married this guy. Um, and they were, when they got together, they were kind of, so from like the age zero to eight or nine, we hardly ever went to church. It wasn't really a thing. And then she, my mom met this new guy and they were looking for a church and they stumbled upon a Lutheran church where my kids actually um, go to school. at. It's a private school. We don't go to that church anymore, but they attend school there. Um, and that's how I met my, he's my, my former pastor. He's retired, but that's how I, so I met him when I was like 10. Um, and so we went to the Lutheran church until I was about 15 or 16 and I had my heathen days and okay, I had I some of those. I didn't, I never left the faith, but I, I was not active. I was not, I was very rebellious. I met my husband in high school and I got pregnant right out of high school. I think I was in high school when I got pregnant, but, um, so that was hard. And when my oldest was a couple years old, I messaged my pastor and I went back to church and so a couple years of me kind of going back and forth and I'd left the church and I had joined a, it's, I would describe it as, do you know the group Hillsong? Yes. The church, Hillsong. So it's our version of the Hillsong church. And I only attended for a couple months, but while I was there, there was a lot of spiritual damage and abuse done to me mm -hmm. as far as their teachings. And I still have issues with it today. What do you mean? So, the things that they taught, I basically was brought up Lutheran, you know, from 10 to when I left when I was in high school. And you, when you're Lutheran, even when you're Catholic, you go through things, a class called catechism where you learn, you know, what you, what your church believes, what, what's the history of your church, you know, like, and Lutheranism, you go through the small catechism, Luther's small catechism, where you have the Ten Commandments and it breaks down. What does this mean? What does it mean to honor your mother and father? What does it mean to keep the Sabbath? And it'll go through the Lord's Prayer. What does this mean in the Creed? So you really know what you are signing, 
you know, ascribing to, you'd know what you believe because to be a Lutheran, and I believe this is the same for Catholics as well. You have to say that you agree to these tenets to have communion because okay. communion is a sacred thing and having communion and not knowing what you're doing can, is really, I don't want to say troublesome, but it's, it can do damage to somebody who doesn't know how serious this is. This is the literal bod and bl bod, blood and body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And you can't just take it willy nilly. This is a serious thing. So even though I had that training and I, you know, grew up in the Lutheran church and I, we went on a regular basis, I left and I went someplace that I believe is truly demonic. Um, they were teaching things like, it's a lot on the prosperity gospel. There was a lot of abuse and family members have of this. And it's a huge church where I live. It's, it's basically the mega church. Um, people are coming out now with their abuse that has happened spiritually, um, physically, mentally that happened to them. And what they taught did a lot of damage to my belief system and what happens to you when you die. And I was doubting myself and I, you yeah. know, I, I didn't know where I stood with God and, um, so we left that church and I, one day I messaged my pastor and I said, I want to come back home, but I need to be retaught the scriptures because I don't know what it is. I don't know. I Isn't said, that amazing how much damage a, 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 a false shepherd can do? Yeah. And I still have issues with it to this day. And I I'm 33 now and I've been back home for over 10 years. And I, when I contacted my pastor, I demanded that he put me through catechism class again, because I, I didn't know, you know, I knew, but I had so much doubt and anxiety, you know, and so that really helped. So now, long story short, <laughs> I'm back in the Lutheran church. Uh, we've been faithfully attending since Paisley was a baby and she's eight. Um, my reaction to things as far as what I believe and how I respond to things are a lot differently. I'm not so like with politics. I have my beliefs on politics. There are people I won't vote for on one issue, you know, whether they're a, for abortion or not. Mm -hmm. if, if a Democrat is pro-life and a Republican is pro-choice, I will vote. I will vote on that single issue. Um, so I'll vote for the Democrat who's pro-life, but a lot of other things I'm a lot more quiet or reserved about. Um, you don't have as strong of an opinion. No, on. It, because it's in God's hands and it's why would I, you know, does this matter for eternity? No, then I don't care. Yeah. So that's how I've handled that. But that church has done a lot of damage and I'm still having to struggle through it. <laughs> yeah. How do you, how do you think you navigate? This is a question I have in my life is like, um, as a new Christian, like sometimes talking to people who are going through a hard time or something and they're not, not necessarily believers, but they're somewhat open-minded or, um, how do you address a, that kind of like false shepherds abuse by the church, like legitimate negative experiences people have had? with Christians or people claim to be Christians? Um, my pastor would say you throw tar and feathers on them and run them out of town, throwing dung at them. <laughs> Not the people who are open and questioning. No, but the no, you mean... who are the false shepherds. In the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no. Um, I, I've met those people and I would just, I'd tell them, just tell me your story. And I'm usually quiet. Um, because sometimes they just need to tell somebody and mm -hmm. to not have the fear of being condemned or judged. That's what I do. And then at the end of, can I pray with you? And then I'll, we'll say the Lord's prayer. I'm not real big on because of the abuse of this church. It's really affected my prayer life because I don't do like heartfelt, nice, long, sappy prayers. I just do the Lord's prayer and I'm done because I can't have my feelings attached to it. Because then I believe that I have to do something for God or I have to do, I have to do works and you, you can't do works to get anywhere with God. Your works are rags. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I wouldn't say my prayers are sappy, but they're very, they're very awkward. 
Yeah. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I do a lot of, we have this thing called the Kyrie eleison, which is Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. So I will repeat that over and over again, or I just do the Lord's prayer and I'm like, I can't, I can't do feelings. <laughs> That's an interesting way of thinking about like a benefit of some of the um, um, more like the scripted rit ritualistic yeah. prayers or liturgy. I think both have benefits. I'm a person who thinks both. Like sometimes my husband was raised Catholic, so he knows the Catholic prayers. And um, sometimes he'll do one of those before a meal. And then other times we'll do like the kind of just personal unscripted. Here's what I'm grateful for. Here's what. I would love help with kind of that kind of prayer. Um, and I think both have benefits and yeah, sometimes people to... write off one or the other, but the ritualistic yeah. one has their positives to that. So the positive I used to years ago, I was a CNA and I worked for years in the dementia unit and the Alzheimer's unit. And I've had, this is where I'm a big, whether you like to pray based on feelings or you say the Lord's prayer, there's a huge benefit to knowing the Lord's prayer and to knowing the ritualistic things, because every dementia patient that I took care of, they could say the Lord's prayer until they died. Even if they were nonverbal, if you had a nonverbal patient with dementia, if you started saying the Lord's prayer or the creed or a hymn that everybody knows, um, God's, um, God's own child, I gladly say it. If you're Lutheran or Catholic, you know that hymn. So the mm. popular hymns with the big um, Orthodox, you know, religions, you get a patient who hasn't talked in years, can't recognize her kids. You start saying our father who art in heaven and they can say it with you. They can say it with you. So that's where I'm a big proponent in the repetitive because you have patients like that who have, there's nothing going on, but you start saying the creed. I believe in God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth. And they're right there with you. Yeah. So that's where I'm a stickler on people knowing because you, that brings a lot of comfort. I've been in situations to where I was, I ha was having panic attacks and I thought I was going to die. And all I would do is repeat the Lord's prayer over and over again. That's the only thing that calmed me down. And I feel sorry for people who are religious, who are Christian and don't have that because how do you get out of that cycle? You know, if you don't have, it's, it's somewhat meditative to do that kind of prayer as well. So, um, physiologically, like what it's doing for you, aside from, you know, your it being it being a, a sincere communication to God, yes. it's also like doing something for you to do something meditative. Um, that's what I think about that. Anyway, yeah. we've introduced our churches, non-denominational, and our pastor and and elders have introduced some elements of ritual because our pastor talks about the importance of of ritual for humans, and um, we do the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. which uh, I know, I'm not sure what creed you do, but I guess it's more we like... Do, we do the Apostles of the Nicene Creed, and then once or twice a year, depending on the festival, we'll do, um, I don't know the name of it, but there's another creed that we'll do, but we only do that one like once or twice a year, and it's super long, so I don't know it. <laughs> okay. I haven't I haven't learned it all yet, although I say it every Sunday, but I need, I need to just memorize it. And you're right, there are certain parts of the Lord's Prayer, of course, I know that, um, and there are certain parts of scripture that I have memorized and it is a comfort to be able to just recite those, yeah. you know, without having to, someone gave me a book of liturgy that I go to often, a couple of my good friends, they, they gave it to us for our, our wedding and it's these prayers that you can say out loud. And sometimes with other, there's different parts if you're doing it out of ceremony and, um, and it, and every, it has liturgies for everything mm -hmm. and, it's so it's such a comfort to be able to find like the perfect one and pray that and the writing is you don't have to think about how to articulate it it's like this is beautifully articulated for me it's mm -hmm. exactly what i need to pray right now you know he's a yeah. good writer um that's funny i find it i find that that very helpful um well tabitha i don't want to keep you too long i keep these about an hour i know we just touched the surface i hope you'll come back and time mix it up with me on a live show. Can you just tell people if they're interested in knitting and true crime, where can they find you online? Murder Knits on Instagram and YouTube. Cool. You guys can find her there. Check out the YouTube channel. It's linked below. And thank you guys for being here today. Thank you, Tabitha. Mm -hmm.